In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So today is the Feast of the Blessed Trinity. I was talking to Father Hennig. What are you going to talk about on this feast? I asked him this week. And uh, he said, oh, it's the hardest sermon of the whole year. And I thought, mm, look, obviously the Trinity is a principal mystery of our faith, so we've got to talk about it. But what are we going to say? It is difficult. I don't know what he's going to say. But I shall probably get a recording of it from a spy and find out what he has to say. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, what am I going to say? How am I going to explain the Blessed Trinity to you? It would be great, actually. If you read through the epistle this morning and it says, oh, how wonderful are the mysteries of God and uh, beyond all that knowledge, it would be really good if I could actually explain the Blessed Trinity to you this morning. This will become worldwide known. This will go out on my little camera here and it will become worldwide known. It will go viral. Uh, this is the one sermon that explains the Trinity and the number of subscribers would go through the roof. And then all these bloggers and things would be contacting me to, to do interviews. Taylor Marshall would probably put a tie on uh, to do his interview with me. And she said, oh, it's just, just so theological depths. And I think the people really appreciate it. Yeah, very nice. Uh, even the modernists would probably sit up and take notice. So it, it could be the start of the conversion of the whole world. Well, there goes another flock of pigs. Uh, it's not going to happen, is it? Because <laughs> I can't explain the Blessed Trinity because no one can explain the Blessed Trinity. I can talk about processions and uh, the generation of the sun or his subsistence, but that's of no more use to you than a, theologi the a theology degree from Edinburgh University. Worthless paper, which you mustn't stick down the toilets, incidentally. <clears throat> so, I mean, for me, it's enough to know that he who proceeds from the Father is the Son. That is the Father, the other is the Son. Distinct persons, one God. There's nothing more to say. I mean, it might be, you might be curious to discover how that is so. But it's futile. It's as futile as, I was going to say, staring at the sun. We, we don't do that very often, do we? Not in Scotland, anyway. But if you were to see the sun, let us imagine it's June next week, that you sat and, sat and stare up at it and say, I'd really like to understand the sun. Let me stare at it carefully with my eyes wide open and see if I can understand its nature better. You'll harm your eyes. <laughs> it's not going to do you any good either. That's another futile exercise. Um, in the end, probably you'll go blind because the sun overcomes, is too strong for the sense of sight. And if you try to contemplate it in its entirety, and not merely insofar as it can be seen, um, you'll damage yourself. You can't look at it directly. You might say in looking at it directly is the best way to understand it, but, but you can't. And it's the same with the Holy Ghost, isn't it, really? The Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's all you need to know. You can talk all you like about the procession, the love of the Father for the Son, which, from which proceeds the Holy Ghost. But really, really, all you're doing is taking something incomprehensible, designed by God, and describing it in incomprehensible terms, designed by you. Well, what good is that? It's no use at all. Now you can say to me, but Father... We're no stupid. We're no ignoramuses. We can understand that. Well, it doesn't matter how bright you are. It doesn't matter what a clever mind you have. You will still be as far away from the truth 
as uh, the difference that exists between your nature and that of God. It is true that we have been promised that one day we shall know him, even as we are known. But that's in heaven, not here. Here, we must be content with looking through a glass darkly. Certainly we have a partial knowledge, and we should certainly try to increase that knowledge according to our abilities, that's true. But our unglorified human nature simply cannot grasp the fullness of God here below. So the best thing you can do is learn the creed. You probably all know the Apostles' Creed. Some of you might even know the Nicene Creed, the long one that we sing at Mass. You might know that. This morning at Prime, I was regaled with the Athanasian Creed, which is exceptionally long and very detailed. You might want to learn that. That's something you can do as your homework for this week's sermon, Athanasian Creed. Um, and what do we see in the Gospel? Well, it doesn't talk about the Trinity, really, apart from in the context of baptism. He gives them, before he says that, a command, he says, uh, to his apostles and thereby to his successors. So that's me here. Uh, that we must teach you as much dogma as you need to save your souls. And, in his own words this morning, to observe all commandments which he has given us. So the moral teaching too. Obviously, you can't observe all the commandments, the moral teaching, unless I tell you, unless I give you authoritative teaching, what the church says about these things. Uh, if I don't teach you all of the commandments which he has given us, if I were to gloss over things that I think might offend you. Oh, I can't say that because there's someone here who it might offend. Well, um, I'm going to get into trouble for that. Or I'm going to get in trouble with the state. <laughs> They're saying all sorts of things that I can't say now. Or well, that's, so, that's just so out of step with how people think in the 21st century, people might say. Well, <laughs> that's no good. I've got to teach you everything. That's my job. I mean, <laughs> do, you, do you think you're going to get this in the nervous order? I think if you go back to the nervous order because you take offence, that they will tell you all truth. They will teach you all the commandments of God. Well, they don't. I think, I think one of the reasons why they don't is because modern priests are not taught all the commandments in seminary. They're not taught these things. These things are kept from them. And even if, as many of them do, I met four of them this past week, even if some of them by their own efforts study these things, and learn what the church has always taught about these things, they're not allowed to say, otherwise the bishop will jump on them. So if, you have a, if you're a modernist priest and you've got your little parish, and you're trying to do your best, and you dress up, you can, you can tell they're dressing up because their cassock is clean, whereas if I took these vestments off, you'd see last week's dinner down mine. But uh, they put it on for going to church and then they teach the faithful or they might go over to the school, which is generally on the same property, and uh, prepare the kids for First Communion. <laughs> well, what will the priest find? Well, possibly what he'll find is that children are very, very well acquainted with uh, the United Nations Charter on Human Rights of Children. Children's rights. They'll be able to recite them off by heart. You ask them to say the creed, even the short one, 
or you ask them what the Ten Commandments are, <laughs> you will ask in vain. I mean, you might say, well, look, there's only seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds. They're in a Catholic school. Catholic schools are not teaching these things anymore. There's parents sending their kids to Catholic schools. They're corrupted more than anything else. Well, there's in Ireland. It was the time of the referendum, wasn't it? Uh, when um, there was a priest in his own church, priest in his own church, and all the kids from the local Catholic school filed in, and then he said to the kids in the sermon, uh, right, kids, if you've not, if, if you've been missing Mass over the last few weeks, or even once, if you miss Mass, you can't come to Holy Communion because you're in mortal sin. The headmistress does no more than stand up and lead all the children out of the church because he's not allowed to say that. And if a priest should say to his children in a, a Catholic school up here, well, look, it's all very well knowing UN children's rights. But you know, with rights come, before the words are out of his mouth, the headmistress will step in and say, Father, you're not allowed to see that, nor hear. You can't say duties and responsibilities. You can't tell children in a Catholic school they have duties and responsibilities towards God and towards their neighbour. These are not just examples I'm making up. These things happen. It's absolutely shocking. They can't say it because either the state will come down like a ton of bricks or the bishop. Even in tradition, I have to say, I have to be very careful here in case I might offend my superiors, but hey, I have to say these things because they're true. Even in tradition, priests are frightened of upsetting the faithful. If we upset the faithful by telling them things that are true, I mean, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, they're not very important things. It's not like telling people when you're in the state of mortals and you can't go to Holy Communion. Everyone knows that, surely. I'm not going to offend anyone by saying that. No, but if I say, well, switch off your phones, because one has already gone off. Do, 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 do. During Mass, can you not switch these things off for one hour, once a week? It's shocking. But if I say it, all people get offended, particularly the person whose phone did go off. My father's picking on me. Well, <laughs> it applies to everyone. It applies to everyone. Women, cover your heads, I could say. Well, look, you all have, so... But there might be some visitor in, and if she hasn't covered her head because she's a visitor and they don't in their church or she's from the Novus Ordo or whatever, so she doesn't know, and she comes in here and I say, for goodness sake, well, you're not covering your heads. Well, <laughs> she'll get all offended and say, well, I'm not going back there. It's desperate. We, 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 we're in desperate straits, really. Uh, so what we tend to do is speak about things that won't offend anyone, things that you, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. We, we all agree. I mean, if I say, well, you know, this, this scandalous practice of teaching sex education to children is an abomination and not only corrupts the children but all future generations of humanity. Well, you all nod wisely because it doesn't affect you. No one believes that here. No one be well, no one believes the opposite, I suppose. Everyone believes that that is true. But sometimes I have to say things that you don't like. Don't go shopping on a Sunday. But it's so convenient. We come into Edinburgh on a Sunday and it's just so much more convenient to buy things on the way home. We're not talking about a loaf of bread or something that you're going to eat there and then. We're talking about going buying luxuries and going buying nice things or even some people will pop off and think, oh, before I go down on the A7, I'll pop into Asda and fill up a shopping trolley. Well, no. No, it's a commandment of God. So thou shalt not do those sort of things. I mean, if I tell you just things that you like to hear, <laughs> it's very nice and it might feel you very, make you feel very smug that you're doing very well, thank you. But it's no good. Along with uh, this commandment to teach you all his dramatic and moral teachings, um, our Lord also enjoys his followers to baptise 
This is the context of this teach them all things. He says baptize, and he says baptize him in the name of the Trinity. And already you think, well, there's nothing controversial about that. That's what we've done for centuries. Almost 2,000 years we've baptized in the name of the Trinity. Well, now, 21st century, you're calling God the Father? The Father? That's very sexist. Oh, they don't even say sexist anymore, do they? Because that's, that's too commonsensical. It's all talk about gender now. Gender. God has a gender. Well, I mean, really. If, if for no other reason, and there are plenty of reasons, a common sense, for example, that God is our Father, because he has said so several times, these words of baptism were given to us by our blessed Saviour. He didn't say, baptise them in any way you fancy. He says, baptise them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's what we should be doing. So for that reason alone, I'm going to keep these words. And, and everyone who is a true follower of Christ should keep those words. It doesn't matter what the, 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 the present fashion is. That's got no bearing on the situation at all. I mean, sometimes it is called in, in, in Scripture the baptism of Christ. That's talking about its author. It's not that you baptise in the name of Christ. No. It's talking about the author of baptism. The formula <coughs> remains the same. And for all those who don't accept of the Trinity, this is quite a tricky thing, isn't it, really? Because the Trinity is very difficult to understand. In fact, it's impossible. Uh, God, nonetheless, has said that we should do this, so we have to do it. But people say, well, this understanding of the Trinity, let's try and make it out that it doesn't really exist. You look at the Greek, the original Greek of the New Testament where this passage comes. It's got the definite article, tu uh, partes, and tu puyu, and tu um, hagiu <laughs> pneumatos. Oof, almost got caught out there. Um, but that's what he's got. The definite article is before each of the nouns because they are distinct persons. And because the definite article is before each of the names, then the, the, the divinity, the Godhead, is predicated of all three. Even the grammar tells you the truth of the matter. Um, so, baptism. It seems I'm talking about baptism, actually, because the two great feasts of baptism are Easter and Whitson. I suppose, actually, we've only just had Whitson. Um, so that's possibly why the Church put this feast of the Blessed Trinity on the Sunday after Whitsunday. Because... Um, we're supposed to explain to the neophytes, people who are about to receive baptism, what it's all about and all the different aspects of it. But perhaps there's not enough time. And so here is an opportunity in the context of the Blessed Trinity to um, explain to them all the details about um, the sacrament that they're about to receive. That it is, well, what does the word baptism mean? <laughs> that it is a sacred bath. It is a sacred bath that washes us uh, principally from original sin, though for adult converts, obviously also from all other sins they may have committed. And it signifies, because it's a sign, it signifies an inner purification. That's the oldest meaning to baptism that we have. I think from the time of St. Justin, so second century, and therefore the fathers who come after him. Uh, they talk about this element of spiritual illumination. Um, and, and almost synonymously with baptism. That they are given light. That they become light. This idea of illumination. St Paul talks about Christians having the eyes of their heart enlightened. They become children of the light and children of the day, he says. And that light penetrates them at baptism and makes them glittering and radiant so that they shine as lights in the world. 
because they are lights in the world. That's what baptism has made them. They're not to be stuck under a bushel, which is a type of tub for the youngsters. A type of tub that you cover the light. No, people must see. You have been baptised and you glitter in company because of the grace that is now inside you. Grace of the Holy Ghost. Um, lights in the Lord, um, says St Paul. That's absolutely true. So there's a bath, there's the illumination. One of the lesser understood aspects, I think, although surely I talk about this at Easter, I must have mentioned this, is this mystical death, that baptism is a death. I say mystical death because, well, it's the death of Christ that gives this sacrament its power. So Christ's ideal death on the cross must be realised in us, but this can only happen by baptism. Now, this is, this is not the legal fiction of the Protestants. We have a lot of those here. Um, that they sort of think that God somehow considered us dead. He considered us dead. And now, he, he, he thinks we're just, without us having changed a whit. Haven't been changed at all. It's like poking the bushel over the, the light. We haven't been changed at all, but what the Protestants think is that we're still a bundle of sins and ghastly and awful and repugnant to God, but he puts, he puts this tub over the top of us, and then it doesn't matter what we're like inside, to him, we're lovely. Gwyna Gwyl, Ivrani Hugh, the proverb in Welsh. Mother crows see their babies as white. So it's nonsense, it's a silliness. Um, we must truly die to sin. In fact, St Paul says, you are dead, he said, you are dead to sin. So, yes, we, we repent of our past sins, but it's more than that. We are now delivered from its tyranny. There is now no more condemnation for them that are in Christ, says St Paul. Yesterday, you may have been idolaters, uh, fornicators, thieves, calumniators, blasphemers. Now, you have been purified, sanctified, and justified in the name of our Lord. I mean, if you ever, <laughs> you ever have to go through martyrdom, which is not out of the question, I dare to suggest, uh, if you ever have to go through martyrdom, and they make, I mean, they might do all sorts of horrid things. You read through the acts of the martyrs, and really horrible things. And they can do this to you, and they can do that to you, and, and it's all ghastly and awful. But once they've killed you, that's it. What are they going to do? Flog the dead horse. It's too late now. You're deed. Nothing, can, they can't do anymore. So, once you're dead to sin, sin should have no power over you. What's the point, now that you're dead to sin? What's the point of flirting with temptation? Or thinking about uh, occasions of sin? Toying with the idea. I say toy, I might again bring up the little mobile device that you carry in your pockets. Now you might just use your mobile device. <laughs> this is ridiculous. But you might just uh, use your mobile device to waste time. Oh, I've got ten minutes to kill. Let me just waste time looking at interesting things. You might use your mobile device to look for far more dangerous things. Occasions of sin, which indeed cause you to sin. Seriously, we're not talking about venial sins of wasting time. We're talking about serious sin, vice, repeated sin. Because they can't leave the little toy alone. 
This thing should have no power over you. You are dead to that. You are baptised in Christ. That has no power. It shouldn't have any power over you. This is death to the old man. Because now you are united to the new man. The perfect man. Christ. Yes, it's true. This death to the old man is progressive. Because the inclination to evil still persists, even in the regenerative man. But concupiscence, which is this in inclination towards sin, concupiscence, and indeed St Paul calls it the body of sin, uh, is already inert. And then by mortification, mortification, putting to death, by mortification, it can be rendered harmless. But if you don't do any mortification, it's no longer Easter now, you can't use that as an excuse. If you don't do any mortification, you just pamper and spoil yourself with just another chocolate. Well, then sin is going to have a hold on you. That's just how it is, that's the mechanism. <laughs> St Paul actually, incidentally I should say, also talks about death to the old law. We're not under the old law talks about death to the old mosaic law in Romans he says this ends completely through baptism there's no more old law the Jews have nothing to teach us I mean at the time of St Paul of course many of the converts were from Judaism and they were thinking oh these, these pagans have converted to the faith just like us but they're not keeping the law just like us. That ends, that ends here with baptism, says St Paul. They have nothing to teach us. Um, they are not, as one unfortunate Pope said, they are not our older brothers in the faith. That is simply not true. They do not have the faith. They hate the faith. They reject the faith. You can still see, there are videos enough on your little mobile devices of Jews in Jerusalem and everywhere else where they hold the ascendancy of Jews spitting on Christian pilgrims. Spitting on them. They hate us. We don't hate the Jews. No one here hates the Jews. I don't hate the Jews. Individual Jews. <sighs> But the, the Talmud has nothing to teach us, nothing. Because along with spiritual death, we experience a spiritual resurrection. We die to sin, but we live to grace. The grave of the old man is the cradle of the new man. If, as St Paul says in the Colossians, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God, he also says in Romans, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall live also together with Christ. And this is not just when we physically die. He's not talking about, oh, we shall, it's future. No, it's not just when we die that we live with Christ. We live with Christ now because we are baptised, because we have sanctifying grace because we have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. We live now to Christ. And if we know Christ, then we also know the Father. As he says to Philip, you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If, you, if we know Christ, we have also seen the Father, and we are animated by him who proceeds from them both, the Holy Ghost. So today's Gospel teaches us that in baptism we were consecrated to the Trinity in the name of the three persons. But our whole life is thereafter consecrated to the Trinity. Our sins are forgiven in that name. Married love is sanctified by it. And the Christian life is sanctified at its close by this lovely prayer, Go forth! O Christian soul, out of this world, in the name of the Father who created thee, 
in the name of the Son who redeemed thee and in the name of the Holy Ghost who sanctified thee. Now look, this is 2024, we're in Edinburgh, there are difficulties. Life is hard. There's all sorts of difficulties. But, and this is another little difficulty, it is not in the Scots nature to get all enthusiastic, sentimental, emotional about the liturgy. Even the word sounds sappy. Liturgy. The liturgy. How are you going to get excited about that? I'd stand up here in rabbit on for quite a while about liturgy. And you should all get excited about the Feast of the Blessed Trinity. And then you both get home from church and then the husband said, what's this cake? Who made this cake? And his wife said, oh, I thought it was the Feast of the Trinity, so I thought I'd make a cake. That's Feast of the Trinity. But this is cake. <laughs> yeah, but the wife's got the right idea. It's the Feast of the Trinity. Last week was the Feast of Whitson. Before that, it was Easter. It was Ascension. These are, real, these are things that used to really light up people's lives. We didn't have bank holidays like tomorrow because it's the last Monday in May. What a ridiculous, prosaic reason for having it. The reason why we have an, a holiday at the end of May is because it was Whit Monday until I was a nipper. I think it was about 10 when it changed. And then it became fixed on the last Monday in May. We get excited because of the Feast of the Church. People only had holidays because of the Feast of the Church. People have Christmas off even now because of the Feast of the Church. Easter, which moves about from here to there every year, it's off regularly because of the Feast of the Christian Church. That's just incontrovertible. You can't get around that. So you should be excited. You should get excited. In your own way, I'm not expecting anyone to clap their hands or to jig about, but you should get excited because this is the face of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, the church exhorts us today that we should remember that we have been born again to God, consecrated to the Trinity. So we must renew our fervour on this day and let our praises ring out to God, to the one God, to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.